After years of helping online businesses make more money by advising them on their taxes and finances, I've now made it my mission to reach as many profitable online businesses as possible to help them save on their taxes and make more money. On my quest, I bring you proven and real profitable online business owners, and we dig into how they do it. Hello again. This is The Few, The Proud, The Profitable. This is the podcast where we talk exclusively to six and seven figure online business owners. We know that in this space especially, there are a lot of people who fabricate, who exaggerate what they're doing. So what we do here is we take the guesswork out of that for you. We vet people, people who are actually successful, and then we get them to share their tips and hopefully provide some value that y'all can incorporate into your businesses. Got one of those today. Ben, thanks for being here, man. I'm excited to be here, although, man, I'm having someone else say that I'm, or allude to the fact that I'm potentially successful, I don't know about that. I feel like there's still a lot of growth left to come, but. Well, I mean, that's probably part of the reason you are successful, though. Maybe, maybe. The, the, the people who seem to be the most full of themselves and you know, have a lack of any sort of humility seem to be the ones who stay where they're at. Sure. Or at least hinder their own growth, I guess I should say. There's a lot of jerks out there who are still relatively successful. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. I guess, I guess uh, one interesting way to determine success is if you went back five years ago and, and like, showed myself, like, are you going to be happy or deem yourself successful with X, Y, Z numbers, uh, I, five years ago, I'd have been like, heck yeah. So yeah. I guess that that is a good sign for sure. Right. Absolutely. I think we get hard on ourselves where we sort of look at with today's lens of how we're doing, not necessarily where we thought we would be five years ago or, or comparing it to where we were five years ago. Yeah. But right now I get real frustrated with whatever the number is we picked up this number of clients, we had this much in billing, added this number of staff, we're working 10 hours less a week, whatever it is. I was still like, that's crap. What are you doing? You're not doing anything right. You're failing. Then you got to remember like, okay, three years ago, this was a real different conversation oh, yeah. and set of goals that we had. Totally. Totally. Yeah. All right. Sweet, man. So just to start off, tell us who you are. What do you do? So my name is Ben Jawalski, and I run an online fitness company called Watt Prep, which is basically if anyone out there is into CrossFit, um, you may or may not be familiar with all the terminology, but uh, Watt stands for workout of the day, and prep just means you know to prep or to prepare. So the company name is Watt Prep, and shockingly, we help people prepare for their CrossFit workouts by improving their specific skills and it's uh yeah basically it is a mix of several different offerings but I, I think the bread and butter for us if we had to describe it is kind of like we have an online school that yeah. helps people learn how to do crossfit better all right so is this info product based stuff yes. mostly like videos of technique Yep. Yep. It's, it's almost all video based because obviously it's very visual in nature, but yeah, um, that's it. It's, it's mostly video courses and now we've expanded to a couple other, other different offerings, but, uh, yeah, yeah. The bread and butter again, is, is just info products. Now that's cool though, because I did CrossFit, geez Louise, that had to have been like seven years ago now. It's been a long time and certain parts of it were cool, but one of my big problems is I have zero flexibility. Mm -hmm. I'm so anal. I'm like, so just, I'm, my muscles are tight. So I got no flexibility and it's all like, you know, the group exercise of go, go, you can do it. Do as many reps as you can. And the, the problem was that I had not nearly enough technique to back up the amount the of effort. Activity. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. So I would end up injuring myself like every other class. Cause I was doing stuff wrong. And Part of that you can put on the gym, a lot of it you can put on me, but if you had something like what you're talking about, where you're able to supplement that. Yep, so that's exactly what we're, we are actually here for is we would, we want most of our athletes uh, or clients as some people call them, we call them athletes because people feel special like that. Um, and in most CrossFit gyms, they say like, these are our athletes. Sure. Um, so the, 
the CrossFitters, we encourage them to go do their normal CrossFit training at a local affiliate. Um, so I know you're in Roanoke, Virginia. I actually dropped into a really great uh, CrossFit gym while I was uh, down there visiting not too long ago. Um, and I'm totally blanking on the name right now. But we yeah. we encourage people to go to CrossFit gyms, and then they use the wad prep stuff as basically that cherry on top, that accessory work to help you either get more mobile or learn a skill or improve your form so that you're doing it correctly. So for us, like if your shoulders, I imagine your shoulders and your hips are probably pretty tight. We have a shoulder mobility course that takes yeah. 15 minutes before class. You can easily go in, do our, do our shoulder mobility, you know, routine and then do your normal class and you probably feel a lot better. So, yeah. No, that, that's huge because again, this could just be my one experience with it. But it seems like because they're trying to get you to, to push yourself to do things you don't, don't normally do, there can be a little bit of a like push through the pain mentality, which to an extent is good. Right. But ha supplementing with what you're talking about to where people are made, since the gym part might be just all about pushing yourself and doing a, as much as you can, as fast mm -hmm. as you can, as hard as you can, having it to where in your, in your spare time before and after you're really honing in on that technique yeah pretty killer yeah yeah um yeah i would say it's a very delicate balance between i'd say most gyms are probably pretty good uh yeah. particularly the one i go to here in denver vantage crossfit is really good at making sure that people don't overdo it making sure that everyone's really warmed up making sure that everyone's moving well but i will say that not all crossfit gyms or any gym but especially crossfit gyms not all are created equal um Sure. Which means you can get a quite a different variety of both good and bad advice, but we try to be the good guys. Well, yeah, and that and that's why I say that could have just been my experience. It could have been just that gym. It also sure. could just be me because people look at the time. This is a twenty-two year old guy, and they don't realize how jacked my back is, and all you know. So yeah, if you, if you walk in, if you walk in wanting to beat everyone, it's definitely it's especially some people who are competitively natured, and then they're maybe inexperienced that yeah. combination can get a little dangerous right. just like if he can do it i can do it right so yeah but no e either way again not throwing shade at crossfit gyms in general but even for the ones that are good just see it's a real cool service that you're offering yeah we, tr we try to just fit in fit in right where uh we think a lot of people just need that little extra help and it's not necessarily something that the local gym is going to be able to provide and what's cool about the internet is with a yeah. A couple of good videos and some clear coaching. You can get a lot of uh, really good stuff out of the, out of the people you're helping. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. So second question, tell me what the best thing about having a profitable online business is. The best thing about having a profitable online business. Well, that's a really great question for me, honestly, and this is maybe the uncommon answer, but, Having a profitable online business means that I can really pay my people well. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of people, a lot of online businesses particularly try to find the cheapest possible labor they can find. Um, right. And for me, it's not like I'm trying to actively burn money, yeah. but when I have profit, I'm not afraid to share it with the people who helped me get there. And I think the loyalty from the team um, is extraordinary. Like we have people who just stay up around the clock to work and to do things for us. And a lot of it's unpaid hours uh, because they're just like, they love CrossFit so much and, and they love what the business stands for. Um, and, and they're willing to like go above and beyond because I'm not pinching pennies with them. I'm willing to pay them. Really right, exactly. They're not worried about the couple hours of unpaid time when you're the hourly you're paying them or the salary or whatever is at enough of a premium that some extra work and effort can be built in. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I'd say that's that's probably one of my uh, that's probably the coolest part about being profitable is yeah. I just I have a little money left over to to do good things to help other people with. Yeah, well, and that's cool too. And there's obviously some balance. I've seen some clients who are just nuts and they hire someone they could have gotten to do customer service work and they're paying them 150 grand. And I, can't quite <laughs> think, I can't quite figure out what, what the reason is or what the value is there. Yeah. But 
what's more common than that is what you described is that people are trying to get the lowest rate possible as much as they can for the fewest dollars. And we'll see it all the time in some of our, some of the clients we have where they're just always complaining, man, I just can't keep any sort of good help. You can't get anyone who wants to work. People leave. We've got the worst turnover ever. And they blame it on the workforce. Yeah. And okay, sure. Maybe to an extent, but you're also paying the guys eight bucks an hour. Right. What if you paid them 10 or 12 or 15 or 20, depending on what the job is, you'd engender a lot more loyalty there and they probably wouldn't be piecing out on you every two months. Definitely. Either they have a really boring business that they're running. I mean, uh, I can say with confidence, like we've never had anyone leave us. It's always been me firing them, um, which is, I mean, that part obviously isn't fun, but it, but that just shows that like, hey, we're cultivating an environment that people want to stick around in. Uh, and I, I just think, yeah, paying people what they're worth and, and also maybe trusting them, just being like, hey, you're the expert. I'm putting you in charge of this. Like, go for it. I know you'll do a great job. I think ha people having that confidence and then also knowing they're going to get compensated for it. People, people are willing to stick around. Yeah. Well, and I've had that even personally. I think you can run into a little trouble because you can – abdicate your responsibility if you're not careful if you let people go go to, without any sort of supervision sure but yeah that's that's largely the way that we want run our practices i'm not a good manager i hate managing people i like either doing the stuff i need to do or i like growing the business um and my interest level in micromanaging people's activities is pre pretty minimal mm -hmm. So like you're saying, if you're able to give people, hire people well enough, pay them enough and let them really take ownership of whatever they're doing. Yep. So long as it's the right fit of a person, I think everyone involved ends up being happier there. Totally. Absolutely. Versus just every five minutes they're looking over their shoulder and you're wasting your time on the precise wording of whatever email they're sending out or right. whatever it is. Yep, totally, man. Absolutely. All right, cool. So third question, one of the things we deal with a lot in our practice, one of the things we help our clients with is cash flow. And we hear from a lot of online business owners that that can be a challenge. So how have you managed that successfully? Well, cash flow, I mean, honestly, I have to, I have to give a ton of props to profit first. That's yeah. That's Great the book. system that I've been using for, I mean, almost five years now. I mean, I started the business five years ago and I think, I think maybe a year into it is when I started using profit for so four years and I haven't missed a pay period on the 10th or the 25th of any month since reading the book. Um, and I've never been late. I've never had to, you know, tell someone that they can't get paid. I have had to move money around a little bit sometimes, right. but I, I think just, just having a disciplined approach to, to allocating resources properly has allowed me to keep my cash flow up in terms of like making sure that I have enough money hitting that income account. I mean, that's just kind of been from us just yeah. kind of grinding and making sure that we promote things on a regular basis. Like we run a, a launch pretty much every other month. We'll do like a big, big launch to the email list. So we're always launching new products and we're always generating new leads. Those two, those two growth engines, as Ramit Sethi calls them, uh, are the keys drivers to the business, new leads, new products. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously those, both of those things create new revenue. And then again, yeah, just sticking to profit first helps me make sure that I kind of have those health numbers in check. It's kind of like monitoring your, your like health markers in your blood. It's almost like right. you're doing that just with the, the lifeblood of the business, which is the cash. Yeah. Well, and I never tell clients they have to do one method or the other. You know, I think profit first is a great method, whether or not they actually do it, setting up the different bank accounts. We don't care that much, but we do always stress is tracking those KPIs. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the nice things about the profit first method is that by having the different bank accounts that it's being distributed to, it's so easy in a snapshot to be able to see where you're wanting and where things are going poorly. 
Totally. Because some of the other approaches that we'd have can accomplish roughly the same thing. You're just coding in additional information when you're doing your books, you're assigning classes, customers, jobs, different things. And you can extrapolate that same information, but it, it takes, I won't even say it takes more effort, but it's, it, it's a little more conscious having to do it. It's right. easy to forget. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to open up my bank account. I might have a Capital One account. I'll just open it up and it's like, oh, I see that we've made this much money this pay period because um, sitting in the income account, you know, have a ton of money in, in the account for taxes. And, you right. know, it's just like, it's always yeah, way too high. That one's always painful to look at. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know that that's not yours and that one's going away yep. pretty quickly. But no, I mean, We've said it probably a million times, but the big differentiating factor for people who are doing well and the people who aren't in our experience dealing with our clients is the ones who are tracking that stuff heavily. Mm, yeah. And that goes across size of business, industry, anything. If you're tracking it, then you really have a good pulse on what you're doing and you've got, you have all, you know what's going right and you know what's going wrong. Yeah. The people who, either fail or who are just really missing a lot of opportunities are the ones who are not with five or 10 bank accounts, but with one bank account are using their bank balance as the barometer for how they're doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first gym I opened before starting my online business. That's, we have one account and it was just like, uh, both myself and the other owner, we would just kind of like, Oh, you know, how, how are we doing? And it was, yeah. we never really knew because we'd always forget about the, the upcoming charge. We're like, oh shoot, we forgot we had to pay this one bill. And yeah. it, was a, it was a nightmare. Or some people just drain out every dime from the business. Sometimes oh, we yeah. run into that where people just be complaining, man, I'm just, I'm broke. Things aren't going well. This is horrible. This is horrible. Why am I not making money? And we look at, we update the books and get everything fixed. I'm like, well, you drew out 200 grand from the account. Of course <laughs> Where did that go? <laughs> of course you don't have any money. It's like, well, I, don't, I didn't spend that much. I'm like, well, clearly you did because you took it out of the bank account, so you need to look at your personal. And then yeah. they forget that they bought a new car or they got a house that has a payment that's twice as big as their previous was. Yeah. Just, just it can be, the, it can run the gamut of what it is. Yeah. But yeah, just by tracking that stuff, I think that, that, you conquer at least half the battle. Sure. Doing that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's been, it's been a huge, huge win for us. And that's, I always suggest every, like once any business, I mean, really it's a great book to read um, mm -hmm. in the beginning, but, but once any business kind of gets their, gets the ball rolling, so to speak, um, it, it definitely has helped me a lot. And again, it's not necessarily because of the specific method and the specific sure. dates. Again, it's, it's literally just like, I'm now accountable to my numbers and I have a decent idea. I have a little literacy behind what those numbers mean. Right. Uh, and that's been huge. Did you ever read Clockwork? Yeah. 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 I finished that one a few months ago. That one was pretty great. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Clockwork was one. Um, and I might need to re-listen to it. That one didn't give me any, and maybe it's cause it's kind of hard already how I run my business. Like it didn't give me any huge, like ding, you know, like aha moments. Pumpkin Plan is another one that he wrote. That one was a, read, that is a big one for me, for sure. Was it? See, he, he referenced that one a bunch in the other ones. I need to read it, but I haven't got yeah, it. Yeah, um, Pumpkin Plan and then Profit First. Those are the two that just okay. really, they gave me the big light bulbs, for sure. All right. Interesting. I'll have to do that. Yeah. I'm sure you have a big reading list like me. Oh, yeah. And it, it always it gets... It gets bigger. I never seem to conquer it. Or yeah, conquer. I'll add three books and read read one, and then it just yeah. it never never ceases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's good though. Even if we're failing, there's at least some degree of progression. Or oh yeah, as long as we're <laughs> as long as we're learning. And one thing I like is like uh, and I've heard a couple other mentors and you know influencers talk about this, but it's really nice to be able to like I love educating. I love reading books. I love. I just wrapped up a, a book about like creating a company vision. Um, but it's, it's really nice to, as soon as you put a book down or as soon as a book becomes stale and you're not getting anything out of it, you have a whole closet full of like, Ooh, that's interesting. And I, I always hop around 
to what I think is interesting. So if there's a, if there's a vein I want to like, or a thread I want to pull, I'll, I'll pull it until it's boring and then I'll move on to something else. Well, I think a lot of these books, and of course you should read them all the way through. There's stuff that is in the systems and their philosophy that's giving you value. But at least to me, it seems like about a fourth to half of the way through, you've, you've squeezed a lot of what you're going to squeeze from it. Sure. It's, it's them expounding on the points and doing yeah. them in better detail. But the first bit is where you get this, yeah. at least for me, just to get Yeah, like for, for me, uh, one book that uh, is a book that I read every year um, is Deep Work by Cal Newport. Um, and that book just talks about like, literally it's like block out your distractions and focus on one thing at a time. Like, boom, you've read the book. But for me to internalize that, I needed an entire book on it. So I need to listen to every single word. I'll listen to a lot of them when I'm walking my dogs. Um, And that's been huge. That that makes me a lot more kind of book productive, I guess you would say. And on long car rides, I'll listen to books. But like, yeah, I agree. Some books, it's like you read the intro and honestly, you pretty much have it. And then other books, if it's something you really, really need ingrained in your your life, then uh, it's definitely worth really digging in and, and maybe even reading it a couple times. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I, I don't know if this is his whole philosophy on speed reading, but one of the videos that Ty Lopez did, it's all about how he reads a book a day. One of the videos that makes it sound like all he does is read the table of contents. Yeah. It, probably what he does. Cause that's, that sounds like a Ty Lopez thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Largely, you can't. Well, you can't really claim you're reading a book a day if that's what that's what you're no, doing. No. And you're not getting the full benefit, of course. But, but it sure I'm, makes you sound cool. It makes you sound cool. And I'm also curious how much of the benefit of the book you get, depending on the book, obviously. Sure. Some, some you you're missing. 98% of the stuff. Some of them I could see you might be getting 20 to 30 percent of the right. just the book just from the yeah. title. Yeah. Yeah, it's always surprised me. There's such a huge market out there. Like Blinkist is an app that I know of. And yeah, I, had a- some, I had someone like really, oh, you've got to get Blinkist. It's incredible. You can read a book in 15 minutes. And, and it's like a summary. And for me, it's like I, I tried a couple and I'm like, no, like, yeah, yeah, cool. I listened to it in 15 minutes. And then you talk to me in three hours. And I'm like, well, what were you talking about again? So I right. need it. So I need it hammered into my brain if, I, if it's going to actually stick around. Sure. Yeah. That's me too. I think we're all getting more and more ADD all the time that yeah. something that fast probably isn't a sinking in. It sells well, but I, I don't think it's, yeah, in practice yeah. it doesn't work for me, but I'm not a robot, so. Okay. All right, cool. So fourth question is a couple minutes, just give us a tip that you think that every online business owner should know. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mentioned earlier, and that was, uh, this is something that I learned from Ramit Sethi, who's kind of like one of my uh, business mentors, I would say. And he talks about how the, the lifeblood of any, of any business, really, uh, and he uses lots of examples, Apple, uh, you know, General Motors, Ford, whatever. You, you need two things happening at any given time. You need new products and you need new leads. So if you think about Apple, right? Yes, they do advertising campaigns. Yes, they're trying to pull people into the Apple sphere of influence. And that's how a lot of, I think, online marketers and online business owners always think they need to attract new people. Yeah. And that's great. It's very important. But you also need new products. Mm -hmm. What if, if Apple only focused on acquiring new customers? That means I would never pay them another cent. Right. Right. But what they do is they release a new iPhone every year. They release a new this, a new that. And then people like me will buy them pretty much immediately. Although I don't have the new iPhone 11 because I just bought the, like I have, I have the other fancy one and it does fine. But, but they're able to keep capitalizing on, on a captive market, their mm-hmm. current customers that know, love, and, and, and trust them. And then they're also attracting new people. So in online business, we need to make sure that we focus on number one, generating new leads. So having 
having that free content out there, having stuff like this podcast, having stuff like, you know, for me, it's YouTube and Instagram and, and Facebook videos and blog posts. And we're just always getting new eyeballs on our stuff and hopefully turning those people into leads and then into customers. But on the exact same, you know, on the, the opposite side of that same coin is we're always releasing new products for our current customers. We have thousands of customers at this point that love what we do. And if we weren't releasing new products consistently, they're not going to be paying us money consistently and that's not good. So it's, so it's a very big, um, you know, very high level topic, but you always need to have one arm of your business focusing on developing new products or even revamping old ones, but new is always better. Um, you just li- literally look at the car industry. If they're always trying to release something new or some like groundbreaking new feature in uh, uh, an old line of cars. And then you also need to be focusing on new leads because if you only focus on new products, eventually you're going to tap out your, your customer sure. base. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's like my huge yeah. tip is, is always have something, um, always have something working to be developing new products and always have something working to be developing new leads. Uh, and that's, those are the two biggest hires that I've made in my company. I have um, a head of product development and then I have a head of growth. She's really the COO. Um, but she, her main KPI is how many new email subscribers do we get? How many fresh new email subscribers do we get? And then on the other side, the head of product development, she's always working on our next, project to make it awesome and make it, you know, even better than our last project. So that's, yeah. that's, that's it. Well, and having the right team around helps a lot too, because at least in my experience, I, well, I think balance is one of the hardest things for us to do in general, just across the board as humans. And at least in my experience, when I've been dealing with clients and looking in the space, most of us want to deal with one side or the other. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of folk, usually most people aren't missing both of those, yeah. but either it's, I'm just going to keep pumping out products. I'm going to deal with my existing list, or they're just trying so hard to acquire new customers that they don't lo- launch a new product for a year or two. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there was one guy I remember and he was just complaining to somebody else about, man, things aren't going great. I don't know what's going on, but you know, money's really trickling off. And we looked, it's like, you haven't launched a product in three years. Yeah. Of, course, of course it's going downhill. What's wrong with you? So they had like one sales funnel set up and they were just like, it dried up. What's going on? Yeah, I think they had basically one sales funnel. They, they just kept running this same. I think they were gr- trying to grab new leads. They were being a little lazy about it. But yeah. It was just blast, blasting the same, same list with the same product. Yeah. To where the growth and the acquisition of the new leads was not at all off saying the fact that so much of their list is like, what the crap is going on? Yeah, Why dude, we've seen this from- offer seven times. Right. Why on earth would I buy this from you? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a very simple concept, but it's, I think when a business can, can strike balance between the two, that's where yeah. they're, they're really going to unlock um, a lot of powerful stuff. I mean, we, we really started focusing on this like a year and a half ago. Um, and it's been a great year because yeah. we've, we have very, cl- it's like such a simple concept too. It's not like, it's not yeah. like we're like, we're just one fancy funnel away. Like everybody thinks we're not, you know, we're just like one Facebook ad away right. from becoming millionaires. It's like, no, we're, we're going to continue to release new products. Some of them are going to flop. Some of them are going to be great, but we're going to keep, keep doing that. And we're going to continually grow our email list. That's it. And if we keep growing our email list, thanks to all of this free content that we put out there. And if we keep releasing new and updated products that the market wants, we're going to keep growing. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what's happening. It's slow and steady, but it, it really does work. And it's so much better than, than any hack out there. It's just, well, I was, I was literally just about to say hack because it's so funny to me now digital marketing has become more and more of a, mature space and industry Mm -hmm. that people are still talking about these hacks because the bigger the space gets and the smarter the platforms get these hacks either don't work anymore or if they do work the shelf life they have is so much shorter than they used to be yeah you might find the hack but it's gone next month yeah and so 
doing the stuff the way you're talking about where obviously there's a lot of work to it. You want to approach it the right way. You have the right technique and strategy to it, but it's not like this little, um, I'm trying to think of a synonym for hack, but it's not sort of this gimmicky thing. Sure. It's very, it's a straightforward where you're doing obvious, smart, consistent yeah. things that are going to yield results. Yeah, I, I think a big problem a lot of online businesses run into is they they try to make the ultimate product and the ultimate funnel, and they just think that like they just need one perfect thing to click. Yeah, they put all their ducks into one basket, and they're just like, and I'm done. And then they just think they're going to be a really big sustainable business. If you can name a single business that's done that, let me know. Uh, but the Netflix is the uh, the Amazons, the Apples, the Fords, the, I mean, like li li literally think about any good company ever and what are they always doing? They're always releasing new products. They're, they're a company. They're not just this one, one funnel wonder. So, yeah. Well, and the people who are so sometimes obsessed about that one funnel or this tweak, or we're going to do this, sometimes they'll make things so stupidly complicated and they'll institute these sort of Byzantine structures sure. to their business or their funnels to where we're going to segment it out this way. And if people do this, then it segments and okay, cool segmentation. I'm all about that. That's a real thing, but they do it to these like 27 layers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't need this funnel that has like, you know, it's a, if it was a choose your own adventure book, it doesn't need to be this 5,000 page choose your own adventure yep. book where if you go to this, then you go to this. And it, it, it blows my mind. Um, and I, I mean, I, I remember falling victim to that idea. It's like, you want to optimize everything. You want everything to be completely perfect. Yeah. But here's the thing is you just like, you can't the simpler, literally the simpler it gets. I think it, again, let's look at some of these, more complicated businesses like these huge businesses the, the netflix the amazon prime like their their quote unquote funnels are so simple mm -hmm. right yeah. they don't need like crazy market segmentation like they don't sure they have lots of crazy tech on the back end once you become a customer but like right. to actually get the customer like sometimes you just gotta just simplify it and that's right. something that we've done at wad prep that's really uh it's really helped the sanity of everyone. Like our, our last e email list launch that we did, it's like, Hey, let's tone it. Like we're going to tone down the marketees. We're going to tone down the, uh, the length of the emails. So we're just going to like make a couple really good videos and just say, Hey, mm -hmm. you should probably buy this thing. Cause it's awesome. I'm right. sure enough people bought the crap out of it. And we realized that sometimes you just need to simplify and people really, really will respond well to that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, sweet, man. So last question. One of two things, if you really want to, you can take both. Either what's the craziest thing you've seen sold online or what's the craziest tactic you've seen to sell something online? Oh, man. This might take me a second to gather my you thoughts. Got time. There was a tactic that I saw the other day that really made me, man, I guess one of the, th I guess it's crazy in a sense that I just think it's crazy that he can pull, that he can pull it off. Um, you know, you mentioned Ty Lopez earlier and one of the, I guess, craziest things that I ever saw was I saw the same ad for multiple weeks that claimed that today was my last chance to get this discount. And that rubs me so far in the wrong direction. I like, it's hard for me to even describe that, but it's just like, it's like the, it's like the kid who cries wolf, right? It's like, if you, if you say, if you cry wolf every single day, you try to make a huge deal every single day about this massive discount expiring, and then all of a sudden I see your ad more than once. Like that's one thing. But the fact that I saw that ad, like probably 20 or 30 times, like it's literally every single time I like hopped on social media, whether it's Instagram yeah. or Facebook, I don't remember. And every single time it was the same exact percentage and it was the same exact 
offer and it was the same exact, you have less than 12 hours to join or it's going away forever. Right. And like that, like I already knew the dude's sleazy, um, but like that alone is just like, I'll never ever touch any of this stuff with the 12 foot pole. Cause I know he's willing to, to very much lie in his marketing um, like blatantly to try to manipulate a sale. So I'd say that's like the craziest thing. Yeah. When I say crazy, yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we both know that that's a dime a dozen out there in the industry. I think it's crazy in a sense of like, I don't understand how people think that it doesn't hurt their brand. Like right. when, when we make a promise to, to our audience or, and to our email list, we back the promise up yeah. um, and, and it helps us. I sure hope so. But when I see people blatantly lie to their audience and blatantly lie to these leads and then like just do it over and over again, I think that's crazy. I just don't get it. Well, pe people aren't going to believe you anymore. Yeah. I, I get the idea of creating some amount of scarcity, but this, 100%. this insane false scarcity. But yeah. there was one guy on my list and it was... I think it was a 97 or 197 offer. It wasn't even like it was a really high ticket thing, but I must have seen this is the last time I'm offering this. Yeah. This offer expires tonight. This is the last time. That must have been going on for not even like, he wasn't even shuffling it to a different product or service. Yeah. It was the same thing for like four months. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> this is on his personal page. I'm like, dude, it's not even like you're blasting this out to your email list where there's, some sort of like barrier between you a little bit. This is literally your personal page and you've been saying last chance for four months. There His was grandmother is going to be like, come on, you've been lying to me this whole time. There was one post I saw the other day. It was, um, someone was booking a flight on some travel site and it said that 37 people are looking at the same flight. And I like, go, well, that's, they're like, that seems like a really high number. That seems so specific. Yeah. So they went into the inspect element of the code and it they found like the label. It's hard coded 37. Or no, it was like, it would, it would go between like any number. It would randomly generate between 24 and 72. Or yeah, something. Okay. <laughs> Where it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. If there are people looking at it, fine if you even want to count the people who looked at it 12 hours ago and kind of lump them into that number but yeah. you're just if you're going to straight up lie i hate that up with a nonsense number that there's no basis in reality people aren't going to trust you anymore and at least if it's me i'm not putting my credit card information on that site yeah that's that's that's, that's very sad i mean we so we use that technology uh we use proof uh, but it's, it's real. Like literally every single proof banner you see, like if it says there's seven people viewing it, it's because there's seven people on the website and yeah, it's sometimes I go on there. I'm like, man, I wish it said like a hundred. Uh, yeah. but yeah, we don't manipulate it. It's, it's the real deal. Um, right. so I understand the marketing side of things, but mm -hmm. yeah, the fact that it's a random randomly generated number, that's so sketchy. Yeah. But again, that, that's kind of why we started doing this podcast is that, it was a combination of trolling the people who are doing things wrong and right. the people who are just fabricating their successes, but also to really celebrate the people who are doing it right. Yeah. Because for the people who are doing it right, there's a lot of kudos that go out to that because there are a lot of challenges in this space. Mm -hmm. Y'all deal with things that the average brick and mortar business never has to. So being right. able to navigate that successfully is super cool, which is, yeah. again, one half of the reason why we yeah. did that. Yeah, and I think uh, kind of on that same note, you just had me thinking like, I guess this isn't necessarily like crazy, but I just one thing I would say to, to people listening is revenue is not the number that you need to really ask about. Like I yeah. can't even begin to describe you how many mastermind groups I've been a part of where like people talk about like, Hey, yeah, we had our first hundred thousand dollar month. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's incredible. Like you had a hundred K month. Like we've never, we haven't done a hundred K ever in one month, we've come close a couple of times, but never a hundred K. And I'm just like, you know, tell me more about it. And, oh yeah. We had this huge launch. And, and then it's like, you know, any paid traffic. Oh yeah. We spent like, it's probably like 
$65,000 in paid traffic. And I'm just like, wait a minute. Like, hold on. Like, so the, the 100K, that's, that's total revenue that has, and that's like before any of the, the ads right. that you ran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like, okay, who cares? <laughs> but, you know, like, I did my, my business did much better than yours last month because I'm not relying on this fickle advertising platform. And it's just kind of like, so for everyone, please, please dig. If, you, if someone's freely sharing all these numbers, you got to sometimes poke some holes in, in the game and be like, ask them how much they spent on ads. Ask them, you know, like, where are where is this money coming from? Because it doesn't just come out of thin air. Well, yeah, because revenue, especially in y'all's space where you're selling an info product to where you don't really have the bandwidth issue that you would with some traditional businesses, that number can be huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you spend 300 grand on ads, you can hopefully recover 300 grand in sales. Sure, I hope so. <laughs> so. I did a million dollars, I did $10 million this month, but if you spent every dime of it on staff development advertising, who cares? Yeah. My, my favorite, I don't know if you've seen this much, is, is the Facebook ads guys, and they'll use the number they're not, they'll use the number of what the ad spend is as if that was their number. You know, I've got a seven, I've got an eight figure business. Well, no, that one, that wouldn't even be true if that was revenue. Right. It's not even revenue. It's the ad it's spend. Ad spend. Or for your clients, not even for you. They just, you're just managing <laughs> pay to pages. You're just or, essentially or, taking money and lighting it on fire and then saying that's a victory. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's, not everyone in the space is like that, but it seems like because everyone, it's so competitive, there's such a tendency to, I say inflate, but I think we all inflate our success a little bit. We're all, especially in a marketing sense, we're putting on a real shiny face and sure. a, a mask, but there's such a tendency to exaggerate absurdly. Yep. On yep. any sort of justification and reason. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. that's what we have an issue with. Yep. And don't be afraid to ask questions. And if people aren't afraid to give, if, or if people are afraid to give you the answers on those bold numbers, I mean, hey, some of them might be true, but a lot of the bold numbers that, that gurus will be claiming, um, there's a heck of a lot of caveats built in there. There's a heck of a lot of expenses and investments and and things that they don't want to talk about because they just want to talk about that sexy big number. Well, and their, and their lifestyle doesn't match it. Yeah. They're talking about how spectacular everything's going, but we'll see it to where not even all, sometimes it'll be with us where they'll approach us and we'll give them our price. And if they were making 5% of what they claim they were making, we're nothing. Yeah. We, we don't, it wouldn't even register or a blip yeah. on their, on their budget. Or we'll be talking to friends and, you know, it's a kind of a close knit space. They're like, yeah, that dude claims he's crushing it and he's doing, he's got seven figure months, but I tried to sell him on a 5k package and he said he couldn't do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's hey, he's, a, probably, he's probably driving a really nice car that was leased, you know? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really expensive lease. Yeah. They've got, <laughs> they've got that. And then, but then they live in like, you know, a, a studio apartment in the ghetto side of town. Yeah. You know, it's only the parts that they can take that's Instagram worthy. That's yes. Going for invest. sure. For sure. hundred percent. All right. Cool, man. Well, thanks so much again for being on here for anyone that's looking to work with you to reach out to you. What's the best method of contact? Um, just, just go to our website uh, or any of our social media platforms. Just what prep W O D P R E P. Um, if obviously I am not for you, unless you are interested in, in CrossFit specifically, um, or CrossFit self training, if you have any business questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I love helping other creators. I mean, um, if any strategy questions, stuff like that, you can feel free to hit me up and yeah, shoot me an Instagram direct message or an email. You'll find it on our website and, uh, yeah, we'd love to love to connect with you. All right. Sweet. Thanks again for being here. Uh, to everyone watching, again, this has been the few, the proud, the profitable, where we only talk to legit online businesses. Thanks for watching. We'll catch y'all next time.